Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to 2021 and our very first Sunday morning online service of the year with Pasadena Church. Hallelujah. Well, friends, it's a new year and we have an opportunity to decide to give this entire year to the Lord. What a way to begin by worshiping and acknowledging the one who brought us through 2020. Come on, you can just pause right there and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But the real question is, what are you? What are we going to do with this new year? Well, I've got some thoughts about that and I'll share them in a little while. But first, let's start this year off right with a time of worship and celebration to the Lord. You see, everything about God is right and we belong to him. So let's go into this worship and praise the King of glory. Amen and amen. It's hard to be here and look at these kids and not be happy, yeah. right? It's hard to be here and look at a child who says, I'm gonna serve the Lord in the best way that I know how. And to not have joy, doesn't that just fill your heart with joy? We thank you all for your service. We thank you for your willingness to lead. We thank you for being young leaders in our church. It's such a blessing to see you today. So this song is just gonna talk about our happiness. We're full of joy. We're gonna express that joy to the Lord. Is that all right? All right. Go ahead and clap like this.
find favor in your sight, Lord, please hear my heart's cry, I'm desperately waiting to be where you are, I'd cross the hardest desert. I travel near or far for your glory. Yes, yes, yes. I would do anything yes. just to see. baby so much want to be where you are I gotta be where you are I want to be where you are I want to be where you are I want to be where you are oh I gotta I gotta be there
glory for your glory Lord I will do anything just to see you to behold you as my king this is one of the worship songs that really ministered to me after our youngest daughter Morgan made her transition to heaven I would pray oh God get the glory I know you're walking with me through this I don't understand it, but I trust you, and somehow, some way, you will redeem this loss for your glory. For your glory. Come on, can you just say that with me? For your glory. For your glory, Lord. It's all for your glory. And I don't know about you, but I'm determined to keep growing in my faith this year, and I am so excited about our time of consecration because I know that we're going to be fasting and praying and searching the scriptures together. And I just believe that hidden in the pages of the Bible is the answer. And it's not Bible reading alone that will grow our faith, but it's receiving that rhema word that means the spoken word or the word that is proceeding out of the mouth of god as you are reading the logos scriptures faith is activated when we receive that rhema word from god amen now in romans chapter 10 verse 17 from the new king james version it says Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Solomon said if we seek wisdom like it was gold or hidden treasure, then we will find the knowledge of God. Now listen to this story. <clears throat> Excuse me. A mother gave her daughter a Bible when she left home for college. After a few weeks, the daughter called home uh, to her mom needing money. The mother asked her if she had been reading her Bible. The daughter said, oh, you know, mom, I've just been so busy with school, but I promised to start. The mother encouraged her that if she would just read the word of God, that the Lord was sure to provide. After a few more weeks of struggling financially, more calls from home and borrowing money from friends the young woman in desperation opened the bible her mother had given her and began to read there in the pages of the bible the daughter discovered three one hundred dollar bills now i know these are 50s but we're going to pretend it's 100s these bills were tucked tightly into the binding of several pages her provision had been there all along, but she had not taken the time to research, to search for that hidden treasure. Friends, better than money and more precious than gold, the rhema word of God is waiting for us. But we need to keep searching, to keep reading, to keep meditating, because God's perfect instructions and leading will come just when we need it. 
Only the Lord knows what's in store for us this year. So I want to encourage you to search the scriptures like never before and get a word from God to stand on. I believe that he never leaves us empty. He will provide you with a scripture, a prophetic word, a testimony, a dream, a vision, a worship song, something of divine substance that will carry you through whatever you're going through in a way that brings glory to God. Hey, family, it's time for consecration. It's time to pray, to fast, and to read the Logos until we get a rhema. Come on, let's pray. Father, we just bring you glory. We say glory to your name, Jesus. You are the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty. And we're praying that your glory would fall in homes today, that your glory would fall in hospitals today. Holy Spirit, we're partnering with you as you go into homes and hospital rooms and ICUs. May there be a powerful release of your healing power and presence in Jesus' mighty name. And Father, I'm praying that the scriptures will be open to us, that your word would just come alive within us like never before, because your word is alive and powerful. And Father, I pray that we would just feed, feed on your word and receive all the nutrients of your word. And in this time of consecration, I'm praying that we would receive new revelation from the scriptures that will lead and guide us in these travel, tra uh, challenging times. Because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my, my path. So, Father, just give us divine insight through your word. And Father, I'm just praying a blessing upon your people that we would read and search and meditate upon the scriptures like never before, that we would read the Logos until we get a rhema. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for that wonderful prayer, Pastor Madeline. And now this first Sunday of the year, 2021, we want to share in communion together. We pray that you have your elements in front of you. Communion is a time where we remember all that Christ has done for us, where we remember his covenant with us, where we remember and worship him, our soon coming King. Today, we want you to join us in this time of remembering Christ. As a matter of fact, um, the writer of Corinthians tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, this is what Paul says. Here it is. He says, I have already told you what the Lord Jesus did on the night he was betrayed. And it came from the Lord himself. He took some bread in his hands. Then after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat this and remember me. That's the word again. Remember me. Come on, just say, Lord, I remember. Lord, I remember. After the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine in his hands and said, this is my blood. And with it, God makes his new agreement with you. Drink this and remember me. So communion, my friends, is a time where we come together to the table of the Lord and we remember all that Jesus has done for us, all that he accomplished through his complete work at Calvary. And we say, Lord, we're with you as you remember us, you remembered us, we're remembering you and we're giving you our lives afresh and anew. We want you to join us now. Would you take the elements? First, we lift up the cracker. For us, it's a cracker, a wafer, a piece of bread, whatever you may have and it represents the body of Jesus, a body that the prophets foretold would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the punishment we deserve, he would take it upon himself so that by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus gave his life that we might have life. This, my friends, is the body of Jesus. Eat all of it. And now the juice the wine, whatever you may have, it represents the blood of Jesus. For the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. So Jesus 
gave his life and shed his blood that we might be redeemed. His blood cleanses us from all of our sin, washes us, freeing us from the, from the penalty of sin, from the bondage of sin. Because of the blood of Christ, we are made whole. And today we thank God for his blood. It'll never lose its power. This is the blood of Jesus. Drink all of it. Amen. Now let's continue to celebrate the Lord and lift him up together today. Now y'all got to help us too by clapping those hands. Come on. Everybody clap those hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to see you clapping. Say this, say yeah.
higher, 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 higher. Y'all remember? Lift Jesus higher. You say. Amen, amen, amen. We want to see the Lord high and lifted up, and it's our responsibility to exalt the Lord. The psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It's one of my favorite songs, and as you can tell in that video, I get a little excited when it comes to lifting up the name of Jesus. And today I'm excited as well as we enter into this new year, this first Sunday of the year. As a matter of fact, I was sharing with um, our church family on our New Year's Eve Zoom call. We had an amazing time and we begin to reflect how in 2020, at the beginning of the year, um, the Lord gave us this thought to build on all year. And, and it was this this phrase, welcome home. Welcome home was our, our, our theme for 2020. And in January, we had no idea what the Lord was really saying to us when he gave us those two words. And we just purpose in our hearts to to share that and to make that come alive with everyone that we meet so that when people came to our church, they would feel at home. But the truth is, maybe the Lord had a different, deeper meaning for us, because in 2020, we literally spent more time in our homes than we had ever before. So we were welcomed home, but it became a time of us learning how to worship together from our homes, learning how to connect with others while staying at home. And of course it was difficult and it still is to this, to this moment, but, but God, I believe was up to something powerful in helping us to understand how important it is to, to be grounded. And we are grounded in the faith and we're continuing to do that. So today, this first Sunday, I'm really feeling impressed to share this message today. And it's titled, We Are the Church. Come on, as a matter of fact, while you're watching, everyone watching, wherever you are, if you're with, by yourself or with somebody else, doesn't matter. Come on, let's say it together. We are the church on three. One, two, three. We are the church. We're the church. And I believe in this, in this day and age, I believe today and this year marks another opportunity for us to really come together and be the church that God's calling us to be. And I'm, I'm sure of it that, that this is directly connected to our identity. And as I begin to think about this message, I thought about how one's identity is very important and it's connected to everything else. Think about it. As a matter of fact, we're encouraged to carry, here it is, to carry our IDs with us at all times. If I leave the house without, without my ID, without my driver's license, I'll go back and I'll go, I'll go back and get it because I don't want to be pulled over without it. Especially being a black man. Help me, Jesus. Don't get me started on that. You see, I don't know. If, if you've had this experience or not as well, but, but I've had my identity stolen. Someone was posting in my name on, on, my, on social media accounts that were mimicking my, my accounts. And they were trying to get others to do things that were not typical of my character. 
And it's difficult to, to reestablish your, your identity once it's been taken. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've got to call the banks and you've got to, to change your credit cards and, and get new cards. You've got to cancel accounts. You've got to change passwords. I mean, it just, it just messes with your mind and it's terrible. And all of this is because the identity was compromised. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me for a few moments. See, I believe in this day and age, if it's true in the natural, how much more is it a spiritual truth? Our identity is more important than our natural identity. Our spiritual identity is more important than our biological identity. And today I'd like to submit to you that as we move into 2021, we must claim and embrace our primary identity as the church. We are the church. You see, when we really come to the understanding of what Christ has called us to, we're able to operate in the world and operate consistently and be relevant. As a matter of fact, our faith in Christ and membership into his family gives, gives us what we call an LTO, a license to operate in the world that we live in. And I believe that this year, I believe that this year we must be the church. We must understand and embrace what it means to, to, to be called the church and the people of God, both in word and in deed. As a matter of fact, one definition of church is, is a group or an assembly of persons called together for a particular purpose. And as a matter of fact, in its Greek origin, it was not necessarily a spiritual term, but, but more of a, a, a political term, or just a term that talks about people coming together for whatever reason, maybe in government or maybe to, to vote or things like that. But throughout the New Testament, um, the church means the universal church to which all believers belong. And if you have named the name of Christ, if you consider yourself to be a Christian, then you are a part of the church and we are collectively the church. And it's important, I believe, as we start this year out to understand that, to embrace it, to embody it. What the world needs today is to see the church the relevant church, not the church tied up in all of the conflict and tied up in the politics of everything and, and taking stands on things that, that aren't even biblical or scriptural. But it's time for us to be the church that the Bible, the Bible reveals us for us to be. And I want to share that with you today, I've given you three, three aspects of that makes what makes us the church. I'm so glad you asked. Well, number one, let's just jump right into it. The first thing that makes us the church is our relationship. You see, we are the church because we belong to God. We're called by his name and, and he's chosen us. You see, in the Old Testament, God chooses Israel to be his people not because they deserved him, but because of his plan to redeem sinful man. The freedom that we enjoy today as Christians can be traced back to the Old Testament and the faithfulness of God to his people. As a matter of fact, in the book of Exodus, chapter six, verse seven, the Lord says this to, to his people. Here it is. He says, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. You see, beloved, God did this for Israel because he was forming um, and, and creating a covenant with them that would last throughout time and bring them even through through history and through all of the events that we look back to be historical now, bring them to, to a place where Jesus comes on the scene and redeems us all once and for all. You see, even then God knew that in the fullness of time, he would send his son to redeem us. So as we move into the New Testament, um, the new covenant is established on Christ and his completed work. Let's lay the foundation here. You see, Jesus, he comes and he establishes his church. 
He establishes his church, as you've heard me say before, anybody who knows me, I actually got it from Bishop Tudor Bismarck, but, but when he said it, it fascinated me, and I've been saying it ever since, that his church is the legitimate agency in the earth. It's God's way of accomplishing anything that he wants to do in the earth. It's through the people of God. What this means is that when Christ wants to get anything done in the earth, he will use and empower his church to get it done. Yes, beloved, we were born for this. Come on, just say it. I was born for this. We were born for this and we must understand the importance of this wonderful relationship that makes us the church. As a matter of fact, what's important to understand is that, that we are Christ church. God started it all, of course, because he is Lord of all, but, but Jesus is the one who founded the church. Jesus is the one who birthed the, the church. Jesus is the one who activated the church. And, and our primary scripture, of course, you may even know this, comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew in chapter 16. Matthew 16, verses 16 through 19 Jesus, before, before we read verse 16, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say I am? And who do men say I am? And they begin to give him the answers that they've heard around town. And people have said, some say you're one of the major prophets. You're, they say you're Elijah. Um, you've come back. But, but Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And then Peter steps to the mic and Peter says, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood has, has not, let, let me just read it. Come on, let's read it together. Matthew 16, verse 16, here it is. Jesus says, well, Simon Peter spoke up. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus told him, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. You didn't discover this on your own. It was shown to you by my father in heaven. So I will call you Peter. God was actually speaking into his destiny, not in the moment, but into his future. I will call you Peter, which means a rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and death itself will not have any power over it. Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and God in heaven will allow whatever you allow on earth. Help me, Lord. But he will not allow anything that you don't allow. See, this is powerful. This, this is, this is, this word of God here where Jesus is saying on this revelation, on this truth that the spirit of God gave you, Peter, I'm going to establish my church. As we embrace and understand this truth, we also are empowered and we're sobered at the same time. You see, I believe the greatest aspect of this revelation by Peter that Jesus confirms is that he, Christ, is the head of the church. He establishes. On this truth, I'm going to build my church. He said, my church. It's the Lord's church. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on, somebody. This should be good news to all of us. Jesus oversees us all. Jesus is over us all. But I, I know that to some in Christian leadership, um, this doesn't sit or fit well with your ministry plan. And I'm really speaking of those pastors and leaders who, who run the church as if it's theirs and, 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 and as, if, as if they are seated on the throne and everyone must bow to them and fulfill their every command. I know some of you are saying, oh, you meddling now, pastor. I know you're messing with us, but, but, but it's true today, even to this day, you can go into many churches today and look on stage and you'll see what I call, I call them the grand poobah chairs. You got chairs, but then you got those grand poobah chairs. They're kind of special and, and they're designated to the man of God. And sometimes, sometimes you may, you may see bottled water for everyone else, but the pastor, the bishop, the apostle, they, they don't drink from the bottled water. No, they drink from a chalice. And you see, all of this gives me a good laugh, but, but we must remember that this is the Lord's church and Jesus is Lord. We are his church, but he is Lord of his church. Come on, somebody say, we are the church. 
You see another passage that establishes this, establishes this for us comes from Ephesians chapter one, verses 22 and 23. I hope you have your Bibles with you today. You know, this entire year, we're going to come, we're coming from the word of God. So make sure you have it in front of you, not just on the screen, but I want you to read it and highlight it, whatever you need to do to remember these, these passages I'm sharing with you. Ephesians one verse 22, it says this, and he alone talking about Christ is the leader and source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others. I hope you're getting this. And now we, here it goes, his church are his body on the earth and that which fills him who is being filled by it. In other words, Jesus is the head of the church, but we are his body. And when I explain this to people, sometimes I say it this way, you know, you never see a head just floating around anywhere. If you did, amen, you'd probably run, um, like, be like the guy on Get Out, like, oh no. But no, Jesus is the head of the church, but we are his body. He uses us. We are his agency in the earth. We are his hands. We are his feet. And we must operate that way based on the relationship that we have with him. It's not just a matter of anybody having ex access, but the Bible says we become his body when we, when we accept him as savior and Lord of our lives. That's when the relationship is solidified, when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God's raised him from the dead. Then we are saved. Then we are grafted into the family of God and we become his body. We become his church. And all of this is connected to our relationship. Come on, say it one more time, our relationship. Number two, we are the church, not only because of our relationship to God and through Christ, but we're the church and it comes, comes through, through our resilience. Yeah, that's another one of those words, our resilience. Come on, say it, our resilience. Remember in Matthew, he said, Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. That speaks of resilience. And when you look at that word there, um, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The Greek word there, um, katiskuo, it means to be able to defeat, to be strong against someone, to overcome or overpower. It means to have the strength or capability to obtain an advantage, to be dominant to have the capability to defeat, to win a victory over. And Jesus says in this powerful declaration that the gates of hell will never be able to overcome or overpower or be stronger than the church. That speaks of resilience. Oh, I know we've gone through some things in 2021. Some of us, um, you know, we, we know that it's been in, in our minds the, the most terrible year ever, but we're still here. We're still standing. Come on, let's just give God a praise. We're still standing by the grace of God. Some have even gone on to be with the Lord. And we consider that to be a graduation because the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. But for those of us who are still here and still standing, we have a work to do and God is going to give us the strength that we need to press forward. We are the church. And you see, friends, we, the church, are a part of God's kingdom, and we're called to forcefully advance against all manner of evil and all darkness, against racism and all the other isms out there, against human trafficking and hateful actions towards innocent people. And in the end, we'll still be standing because we are the church. I just want to say this to someone today. You may have gone through, um, and may, you might still be in the midst of, of, of the most terrible um, season of your life. But I heard somebody say, amen, when you're going through hell, just don't stop. Keep going because a brighter day is coming your way. And if you are a part of the body of Christ, just know that the greater one um, resides in you and you're going to make it through. We are resilient and this resilience shows in the people of God. 
And it's our calling card. Amen. You see, Psalms 145, verses 10 through 13 um, in the NLT, um, David gives us this, this beautiful description of, of, of who we are and what we do. Psalm 145, verse 10, it says it like this. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm compiling some examples of God's power in my life and power in my situations. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For here it is, for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. Hallelujah. This reminds us, friends, that our resilience, our resilience comes from our relationship and it, allow, it, and it allows us to choose our reaction to the circumstances we face. When I, when I say that, I actually get that phrase, choosing our reactions, um, from a book that I read called Man's um, Search for Meaning by internationally renowned psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. He wrote in a memoir of his, of his imprisonment in concentration camps during World War II. And Frankel was held in several camps before he was liberated from the last one in 1945. Listen to this, according to, according to the account. During his time in the camps, Frankel witnessed the extreme cruelty of camp guards, and the prisoners who were given special status by the guards, he also known as capos. He also witnessed the cruelty of prisoners to each other as they underwent the three stages of reaction to their imprisonment. This is what he writes about. These stages are denial, acceptance, and adjustment after their release. You see, Frankel discovered that although the prisoners seemed completely powerless, here it is, they had the freedom to choose their reaction to their circumstances. Those prisoners who were most resilient, according to Frankel, were those who had something to live for. Hallelujah. As I read that and read the account, it just blessed my heart. You see, Frankel's memoir reminds me of the church. We must go through all types of terrible things. Being a Christian doesn't mean we're spared from trouble. It does, however, assure us that the greater one lives inside of us and he will be with us through it all. Come on, somebody say through it all. And furthermore, our resilience comes from confidence in knowing according to our faith in Christ and the scripture that we win. We win. The end of the book, amen, if you can't wait, you go to the end of the book, Revelation tells us that we win, Jesus wins and we win, his church. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10 gives us a scriptural reference to what Frankel was talking about in his memoir about um, the concentration camps. But, but from our perspective as believers, this is how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10 in the Living Bible. He says, here it is, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. These bodies of ours are constantly facing death, just as Jesus did. So it is clear, Paul says to all, that it is only the living Christ within who keeps us safe. Christ keeps us safe. The Christ within keeps us safe. 
Doesn't mean that we won't go through anything. Doesn't mean that we won't have heartache and trouble. Pastor Madeline talked about it earlier about when our daughter Morgan passed away. It's been three years and I know many people, when we talk about loss like that, many people have moved on, but to us, it's still very real to us and it still impacts our, our family and, and the way we live our lives today. But we do it because the greater one lives in us and it is the resilience of Christ that we're still standing today. Hallelujah. It's our relationship, number one, our resilience, number two, and number three, finally, um, we're the church because of our resources, our resources. You see, in the greatest view of things, we are responsible. We're responsible for the stewardship of the earth and of humanity as the church. I'm talking about the church. This is why it doesn't make sense for us to fight each other or destroy one another. We are all connected. We're all related. And it's going to take our cooperation and consideration of others to accomplish everything the Lord has for us. You see, this is how I feel about, uh, now, now I'm, this, is, this is me speaking. These are my personal comments, my personal opinions, but I believe it's the truth. Hallelujah. But this is how I feel about the issue of church rights versus public safety. This is what we've been wrestling with in California and others have been talking about it. We know that the church will be around at the end. We talked about that because point number two, our resilience. But that doesn't mean we can disregard the safety of others by ignoring requests to wear masks or to stand six feet apart from someone. You see, when we ignore these things and, and just say, well, well, that doesn't affect me. I'm, I'm safe, sanctified, <laughs> and filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But, but when we do this, we're not representing Christ effectively, I believe. I believe we're called to take care of each other. And when I wear a mask, it's not so much for me. I've got faith, amen, I, I believe I'll be all right, but I'm wearing it for the safety of others. Remember church, it's all about others. One of the most obvious signs of the church is the fact that we are resourceful and concerned about others. You see, in the early church, um, the earliest church, the, the first visible um, um, manifestation of the church in the earth was the Acts 2 church, the first church. Without seminars, without conferences, without technology and tax exempt privileges, they just began taking care of each other. This was built into the fabric of the church from the beginning. As a matter of fact, it shows us here in Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 45. I want you to turn to this one with me. Come on, get your Bible out. I'll wait a second for you. Acts 2, 43 through 45. In the message, it says it like this. Let's look at the first church, the early church. After the, the, the conversion on the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 were added to the church that day. A brand new church, 3,000 new members. What do we do? They didn't have a manual. They didn't have a handbook. But look what, what began to happen. The Bible says it here. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a, in a wonderful harmony. Here it is, holding everything in common. What does that mean? The next sentence says it. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. So that every person's need was met. Isn't that powerful? That's the church. Resource. So when people became a part of the church, the family of God, everyone understood that you're my brother, you're my sister, we belong to each other, we must take care of each other. And they demonstrated that in tangible, verifiable ways. Again, we find you've got, whenever I read Acts chapter two about the church, I got to throw in Acts chapter four. We read in chapter four, we see how the church operated as well. Here it is, Acts 4.32. It says, all the believers were one in mind and heart. Selfishness was not a part of their community. Say that again. Yeah, if we were in church, somebody say, say it again, pastor. I'm going to say it again. Selfishness was not a part of their community. 
for they shared everything they had with one another. My Lord, my Lord, when have we ever lived this way? How many churches do you know um, operate this way by sharing everything they have with one another? I don't know, but I'm telling you today that Pasadena Church, we want to be that church. We want to live that way. We're determined to share all that we have with one another and make sure that we're all well as we walk together in one another with limitless love for our community and our world. You see how I I threw that little mission statement in, right? We, beloved, must find our way back to this way of life, back to being the church that provides for one another. As I was saying, we had a Zoom call um, on New Year's Eve and and um, we, we had our church members on there. We were all talking and fellowshipping and I was sharing some of these thoughts with them. And I was so blessed when I received a text shortly after from a sister in our church who heard me speak about asking the Lord to show us how we can help others, asking the Lord. That's what this time of consecration is about, asking the Lord to lead us and to guide us and to show us how to be the church. And she did this and she said, Pastor, um, in her text, she says, I'm willing, I've asked the Lord and I believe that, that this is what he wants me to do. I'm willing to commit to helping any of our members who struggle with technology so that they can participate in our online ministry. I'm willing to help them to be able to to navigate technology so that they can be a part of this church um, in the way that we're being the church right now. And that just blessed my soul. And And as she shared that with me, I just told her, thank you. And I said, Lord, let this be the prayer of all of us. May we all seek you and, 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 and hear from you, Lord, how we can be a part of the church and make other people's lives better, the quality of life of all people. You see, in the final analysis, Jesus expected this lifestyle of, of limitless love to become the identifier. It's really the signature of the church. When Jesus declared this in John chapter 13, verse 35, this is the last scripture I'll share with you, but turn with me, the gospel of John 13, 35 in the CEV, Jesus said this. He says, if you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. You see, Jesus was saying that the the litmus test of of being the church, how do you know the church when you see it? How do you know someone belongs to the church when you encounter them? Jesus said that the world will know by the way we love one another. When they see um, the way that we share our resources with one another, when they see the resilience that, that we have going through difficult, challenging times, but coming out with joy, still standing um, by, by the grace of God. When they understand that we're all related, not only by the way we call each other brothers and sisters, but by the way that we live selflessly, they'll know that we're his church. Beloved, we are the church, and I believe the Lord's calling us to to, kind of dig into this this year, to flesh it out as the people of God. And we'll be sharing, I'll be sharing more about it later, but I want to pause here and I just want us to pray together. If you don't mind, I'd like to pray with you and pray for you today. You may say, well, pastor, the truth is I'm not a part of the church because I'm not a believer. I haven't given my life to Christ. Well, I'd like you to pray with me today. I'd like to invite you to receive Christ. I want to invite you if you say, well, I've been a part of a church, but I was disappointed by the leadership or, or there was a pastor that, that, that was living immorally and it, and it compromised the ministry. All of these types of things are real and they happen, but that doesn't mean that the church does not exist. And we want to get back to being the church that God calls us to be. We pray that he would heal you and help you as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. This first Sunday of the year, we come to you and we give this year to you. We begin the day by saying, Lord, we want you to take all of us all year long that you would be glorified with us, with our lives. And, and as we say yes to you, Father, that we would also embrace, Lord, this, the truth of being a part of your church, the body of Christ, where every member is significant and you've got a part for all of us to, to play. We say yes to your will, yes to your way, and yes to your church. God, get the glory out of our lives. 
Help us to understand day by day what it means, Lord, to live for you. Help us to understand as we read the Gospels over these next 21 days. Help us to see you, Jesus. Help us to see justice. Help us to see peace. Help us to see love demonstrated and lived out. Lord, open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, so that we may see you and that we might be the church that you're calling for in these last days. And I pray for that person, Lord, who 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 needs you in asking you to, to come into their hearts. As a matter of fact, if you want to become a Christian, pray this simple prayer with me. Pray it out loud. Just say this. Dear Lord, dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I give you, Lord, all that I am. And I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. But I thank you that you came for sinners. You gave your life that I might be set free from the sin and the shame that has captured me. Today, Lord, I receive you into my heart and I ask you to be my Lord. From this day forward, I declare I'm yours. I'm whole. I'm healed. I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much, beloved. If you prayed this prayer with me, I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to text the words, I believe, no spaces. Text the words, I believe, to the number on your screen, 626-602-1165, so that we can stay connected with you, and we want to send you some resources that will help you in your newfound walk in faith with Christ. We want to make sure that you make it, and the prayer that you prayed, you will know that you have a support system, a church family, family who, who's going to care with you, care for you, and walk with you on this newfound journey. As a matter of fact, if you're not able to text the words, I believe you can go to our website, PasadenaChurch.com, and on that homepage, there's a decision card page tab that you can click and, and fill out the information to let us know you're making a decision to follow Christ. You're renewing your relationship with Christ or you simply desire prayer. You want to be baptized. You can let us know um, on that page and we will follow up with you. Now, I want to take a moment to to let you all know about Consecration 2021. I don't know if we've had the slide for that, but Consecration 2021 begins today. It begins today, um, January the 3rd at 6 p.m. from 6 p.m. this evening until 6 p.m. on January the 24th. For 21 days, we will be fasting and praying as a church community. We will be reading the Bible together. Now to fast, we ask you to choose, prayerfully choose, prayerfully choosing me ask the Lord um, and seek the Lord as to which fast you should choose but we want you and we believe the Lord's going to give you one to follow whether it's a water only fast a juice fast there's the Daniel fast there's the meal a day fast there's a gradual there's a lot of different types of fast some of us are going to fast from social media some of us are going to fast from television and and all of these things that that fill our time and our spaces so that we can seek the Lord once you've sought the Lord for the fast that he wants you to participate in. We want you to begin this evening at 6 p.m. for the next 21 days. And then we want you to read the gospels with us, beginning with the gospel of Matthew, one chapter a day for the next 21 days. Read the gospels with us as a church. And then we'll be sharing about what, what that, what's happening to us as we read. As a matter of fact, Pastor Brad um, just finished um, walking through the Psalms with us. It was amazing. 150 Psalms. We read a Psalm a day and shared, and we're going to do the same thing with the Gospels. Every Friday morning at 7 a.m., there's going to be a Zoom that you can join, and on that Zoom, you can talk about what you've read. As a matter of fact, Pastor Brad is creating a study guide so that as you read the Gospels each day, this study guide will help you with some questions and some thoughts and break down 
breaking down what we're reading, and then we can talk about it those Fridays, every Friday at 7 a.m. And we want you to join us. Even if you can't join us on Fridays, you can still get the study guide by reaching out to Pastor Brad. I believe that his email address should be on the screen with that flyer as well. And then we're going to add some small groups as well. There's going to be a few small groups based on um, um, support and those things that we believe that, that we can walk with our, our members. Um, there's going to be a small group for men that I'll be leading. There's going to be another one for lifestyle. Those who are designed to change your lifestyle, your eating habits and things like that. We want to we want to begin to walk together with one another and share our resources together. There's going to be a Wednesday prayer and, and every Every Sunday evening at 7 p.m., we're going to have another prayer on the, a Zoom prayer for our entire church for these next three weeks, every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. So we want you to join us and to be a part of this as we seek the Lord together. Of course, every morning we have United Prayer. You guys are familiar with the United Prayer at 6 a.m. Monday through Fridays. That will continue 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Um, Eastern. Um, if you dial the number 609-663-5949, amen. You can join in with this prayer. We'll be praying specifically during this time of consecration as well, praying for our church family and praying for you. Now, we are so thankful, as um, Pastor Madeline may have mentioned, if not, we, I know we sent out an email that we were able to meet our, our, our um, Christmas Christ birthday goals. We, we were able to raise over $10,000 and do all the ministry that we had purpose to do, um, serving the boys home and serving um, Altadena school. We were able to bless kids and bless families. And it was just amazing that your giving did that. And you may wonder, how can we give and be a part of this? Well, there's ways for you to give to this ministry um, should the Lord um, bless you to be able to. And these are on your screen. You can give through our website. Of course, you can give through all of these new apps that we have, the Zelle and the, and the Cash app. I believe we even have Venmo. We'll have to add that. Um, you can also mail in a gift to Pasadena Church to our address 404 East Washington Boulevard, Pasadena, California, 91104. But just know this, we're so thankful for every gift that comes to our church. We consider it a blessing and we are committed to being faithful stewards over um, those gifts that we receive to our church and use them in a way that would glorify God and show that we are his church and connected to him. So thank you um, for that. Finally, we want you to continue to follow us on Facebook. You can continue to watch us on YouTube as well um, under Passing the Church and Passing the Church Online. But more than anything, we're excited about this year. We are the church. We want you to know that we love you. We believe in you and you matter to God.